Well, praise the Lord. You can be seated if you can. I don't know but I, about you, but I feel the Holy Ghost. And, and Pastor Mike, you better get up here because it makes me want to preach, brother. But I am so thankful for Pastor Mike and Linda to be here. Uh, he'll always have an open pulpit when he's coming through. We know that he, they gave a lot of their life to you guys and to this place. And uh, they've done really well, and, and we just appreciate them and love having them here. And uh, I, I don't understand why you come in December instead of the summertime, but, you know, to each their own. Praise the Lord. <laughs> Pastor, whenever you're ready, come on up, and I'll turn it over. And uh, however the Lord leads you, you have freedom. How many of you will be real truthful and say that you said something like, I don't see how God could ever use me? One of you is being truthful. I'm going to say it again. How many of you would honestly say, I don't see how God could use somebody like me? Okay, Vern and... Uh, Okay, there's a few more of you being honest. I'm going to ask you one more time. How many of you will be truthful and say, I don't see how God can use somebody like me? Yes, that's more representative of what I'm feeling. All right, my second question is, how many of you are saved? All right, you're the ones I'm talking to this morning. Those of you that raised your hands on both counts, I'm talking to you. Father, we just pray your Holy Spirit this morning would quicken our hearts and minds. Speak to our hearts, Lord. We just want to be the kind of person today that you can speak to. If, if we've said, God, how can you use me? I, I stand here with that same statement, Lord. I, I've said that. I've about flunked out of speech class. I would get totally red and embarrassed whenever I had to stand in front of people. But Lord, you did something. And I thank you. And I'm so grateful, Lord, for the work of God in, in this life. We commit this day to you. Anoint our hearts and minds in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> I've picked a few texts. Primarily, my first one is 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 15. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. He came into the world to save sinners. Didn't he even also say, I come not to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance? That's his purpose for coming to save sinners. Now, there are so many proofs on the subject matter that I'm preaching on today that I, I really struggled with it because I had all these thoughts. I had this sermon pretty much all put together before we ever left Florida. And I like to do the kind of sermon where I can give you some Greek and some Hebrew and, you know, get into a little word study. That's kind of my thing that I like. But um, the Lord didn't take it that way. And I kept saying, come on, Lord, just a little bit. But anyway, it just didn't work that way. Pastor Dave, a few weeks ago, uh, <clears throat> And the sermon he preached the first week we were here was touching on what I was going to preach on. Man. And then he posted something on Facebook that says the reason people come to church, 86% of people that come to church come because somebody invited them. Doesn't that blow your mind? Not because of some major evangelist, not because somebody big did something someplace, but because somebody invited them to the house of God. 86, can you get that? Almost 9 out of 10 people are in church today because somebody invited them. <clears throat> How many of you are here because somebody invited you? That, that's pretty good. I'm impressed. Luke chapter 2 verse 11 says, For unto you is born this day in the city of David a what? A Savior, which is Christ the Lord. Matthew chapter 1, verse 21 says, And she shall bring forth a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. The whole theme of Jesus' coming is salvation. 
for people to get saved. Now, there's a lot of areas that God's people go into, and, and I, I don't want to start a conflict by what I'm going to say next, but the emphasis is salvation, not the baptism of the Holy Spirit, not even healing, both of which I strongly believe in. I am here today because of his healing power. When we first moved to Florida, one night I had some major issues going on and I didn't understand it. And I won't get gross, but I had to make about six trips to the bathroom and nothing but blood was coming out. They called the ambulance, or Linda called the ambulance, and they rushed me to Gainesville Hospital. And I ended up having to have um, seven units of blood to stay alive. And then they could find no place that I was bleeding from. And the heart doctor, I talked to him, and he says, what's going on? I said, what do you mean, what's going on? He says, well, um, what's going on? I said, if you mean what's going on physically, I said, I had an issue and told him about that whole story. And he said, I know that I read all those reports. But what do you think's going on? I said, I don't know what you're talking about. What do you think is the reason for all this is, and, and, and all that happened? What, what do you think is the rhyme and reason behind it? And I said, Doc, all I know is this that when I started losing all that blood, I posted on Facebook, pray for me. And I said, I've been a minister for almost 50 years at that time. Well, it was 50 years at that time. And I said, all I know is I post, posted on Facebook and I had friends, friends from all over the world, missionaries in Africa that were posting back, we're praying, we're praying, we're praying. So they did every two of every major test they do, two endoscopes, two ultrasounds, two MRIs, and finally I had to swallow a pill, which is a camera, that took 50,000 pictures going through my whole body. And the end result was, we find no active bleeding. So Doc, and this is what I did, I looked him right in the face, so Doc, I don't know what you think, but I believe it's a miracle. Folks, so when I say I'm the, the emphasis of the church isn't necessarily to be healing or even baptism of the Holy Spirit. And I believe in both of them strongly. But the emphasis has got to be salvation. Salvation. When I was here last spring, in March 19th, 2023, I preached on a sermon called A Mark on the Forehead. And my theme those months was God has called us, his church to be watchmen. Watchmen over our home, Watchmen over our our family, our extended neighbor, our neighborhood. And I'll, I'll, Pastor Dave brought it up last week, but I'm going to say it again. I make no apologies for spending probably hundreds, maybe even thousands of hours in Richville talking to neighbors. Some of you are here today because I talk to neighbors. Amen. I make no apologies for that. My message has not changed. So this sermon I'm preaching today is not going to be anything new. Everything I'm going to say, for the most part, you've heard before. But we've got such a hunger for God, and you do too. And you know what? God's got a hunger for his people to worship him. In fact, the scripture says in John 4 that he even seeketh such to worship him, those who will worship him in spirit and in truth. I want to be that kind of guy that God is seeking. Amen? Can you say that? I want to be the kind of person that God is seeking. Somebody that worships him in spirit and in truth. Praise the Lord. During the last few weeks, Linda and I, because my internet in Florida stinks. So Linda and I binge watched The Chosen. So we watched season one, season two, season three. Season three, two times. And yeah, they took some creative license when they filmed it, for the, but for the most part, it, it's, it's accurate, and I liked it. But one of the things that kind of um, blessed me the most about it was it showed the humanity, the personal struggles of those God had chosen. Now, I say creative license because I don't read about the things that, that the movie portrayed about um, Simon Peter and his wife and losing a child. I don't read any of that in scripture. So that's creative license. I don't, I, I don't see that. But it did indicate, and there is enough scripture to verify that Peter did have some struggles personally. <laughs> Amen. And don't we, anybody here that never has any struggles? I don't see any hands. Yeah, we have struggles. But 
I love seeing him heal the humility as they went out. And he said unto them, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. He that believeth not shall, shall be damned. And these signs, Mark 16 says, shall follow them that believe. And I'll give you a little word study here. The word follow in the Greek means to come as a result of. As a result of this, this happens. So the scripture says, Go into all the world, preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth, he that believeth shall be saved. Again, there's that salvation thing again. And these signs shall follow. So all these other things we talked about, the healing, the baptism of the Holy Spirit, laying hands on the sick, all those come as a result of the salvation experience. So if we start majoring on salvation, and, and work in the minor stuff, not, and listen, the bulk of what I've heard a lot of Christians debate on is healing, baptism of the Holy Spirit, and all the other stuff. Those are not the majors. The majors is getting people saved. And as they get into the Word of God, they get hungry, and this happens. And my home church where I grew up in, and I churches I pastored, people get hungry for the Word of God. They get saved, then they get hungry for the Word of God, and then they see this Pastor, what is this baptism of the Holy Spirit? Then we can work it in. But let's get them saved first. Amen? What about this healing thing? Or somebody says, you know, I'm saved, and I, and I, I just found out I got this or I got that. Pastor, will you pray for me? Well, when they come believing out of the gate that God really cares and God saved me, and he's going to take care of this need too. These signs shall follow. Come as a result of them that believe. I bring all that up because a lot of times we major on the minor and minor on the majors. And I don't want to do that. So what I'm going to do today is just tell you a bunch of stories. So my sermon today is called My Story. And it's not where I wanted to go today, but it's really what I felt God was telling me to do. I'm going to give you a lot of stories about people you know. Story number one. There's a cute little five-year-old girl standing on a pew in the church her dad was pastoring. And her dad was not ashamed to get up and preach about heaven and preach about hell. One night, this cute little five-year-old, I'm emphasizing cute because she was and she still is. This cute little five-year-old girl, after listening to her dad's sermons on heaven and hell, ran to her mom and dad's bedroom and crying, crying, I don't want to go to hell! I don't want to... Can you picture a cute little five-year-old girl running to the bomb and dad's bedroom saying, I don't want to go to hell. Well, they prayed for her on the spot. And she accepted Jesus as her Savior at five years old. I call her cute and all that because she's my wife. <laughs> she went on to be a pastor's wife, a worship leader, and you all know her as Linda. But it started out as this little five-year-old girl that didn't want to go to hell. I say that because a lot of times sitting in church, it's our people stupid enough to argue and say, well, God, I don't think like God can speak to a child. A little child shall lead them. God put it in his word. Amen? So don't ever rule out a little five-year-old child that's hungry for God. If they want to run up to the altar, hallelujah. But I'm talking about my wife. She was that little five-year-old girl, and I've got pictures of her standing on the second row back on a pew on this side in, in Arcanum, Ohio, with her hands raised to Jesus. Folks, I'll take that bride any day. Amen? Wouldn't you? Sure. I'm going to tell you another story. A lot of you know this person. I'm going to tell you things maybe you didn't know. But we used to have a family that would sit over, well, when they first started coming, they sat over about a row behind where Pastor Dave is. And then later on, they started sitting about where Nick is, and Betty. Harry Wagner. Harry Wagner was a 30-year alcoholic. I never told these, some of these details because they were going to the church and, and it wasn't edifying or any need to. But Harry would drink three-fifths of whiskey a day. 
I saw the evidence. Alice showed me their trash can. He would spend a thousand dollars a month at the state store on whiskey, and he never shared it. If you want to drink with Harry, you brought your own, because his was his. But they came one night. And this is where I want to get kind of personal on some of this stuff. Renting one of the homes he owned, which happened to be next door, was a wheelchair-bound lady that attended here, Debbie Adams. Debbie was the kind that, you know, can God use somebody stuck in a wheelchair? I'm an invalid. I can't do this. I can't do that. Well, you didn't keep Debbie in too much. She got a hand controls on her car. I had fun driving that thing because I had to learn hand controls to, to do anything with her car, which I did. But anyway, one day, Harry was sitting in his driveway, drunk, ready to end it all. Harry's wife, Alice, I don't know what to do. Debbie says, you got me to call my pastor? Please. So they called me. I took John Mackin with me because John was an alcoholic at one time. But we went over there and we met in Debbie's living room. We talked and we talked, and we prayed, and we prayed. We got a kitchen chair out, put it in the middle of the living room. Harry would kneel on one side of the chair. I would kneel on the other side of the chair. He would grab my hands and squeeze them tight and press his forehead against mine as I began to pray. And I prayed about everything that we had talked about. And then I stood up, and he sat down, and I sat down. And then he talked and 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 talked. Question and question and question. And then he said, let's pray again. He kneel at the chair. I kneel at the chair. We grab hands, press foreheads together, and cry out to God. That went on three or four times. We knelt at that chair. Finally, we stood up. I walked him back to his house. He said, I'll see you Sunday. Well, I'd like to have a dollar for every time I've heard that one. <laughs> his beard was down to here. The white was stained yellow. His hair was back here, same length, kind of all around the circumference. He came in Sunday, and if you ever watched that show with Pernell Roberts years ago called Trapper John M.D., that's what he looked like. He was cleaned up, shaved up, haircut, and Harry and Alice hardly ever missed any Wednesday night, Sunday night, Sunday morning for the next, I don't know, five, ten years. They were just faithful to the house of God. I was so impressed. But one time Harry told me, Pastor Mike, when church is over, I just don't have any time to get your attention and talk to you about things that I need to talk about. Will you come and help me and work with me? Well, he, he put in these restroom partitions and Camelot music, Timken out here on Faircrest Plant, um, the big federal government building in downtown Akron that had those big stainless steel link doors that came down him and I installed that one many years ago but he said will you come and help me I'll pay you to work with me just so that I can get your time one on one and the whole time we are mounting garage doors the whole time we are installing restroom partitions I mean when they built the Camelot music I don't know what it is now him and I installed all those restroom partitions. When they built the Faircrest plant out here of Timken, him and I hung all those restroom partitions. I mean, we just worked. But he said, I will pay you to come and work with me just so that I can pick your brain. And my, 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 did he have the questions. <laughs> but he paid me $50 a day to come and work with him. And that was so vital because that was back in the day when I was paying my own rent, I was paying my own utilities, I was making $250 a week gross, 
I mean, we paid utilities all the way up until 2004, until things changed. And thank God that God has always been our supply. One time Harry called me and said, Pastor Mike, I got a vision. I said, really, what's that? I need to talk to you. So him and Alice came over to our place when we were still living in Navarre. Navarre and he said, I got a vision. You know we own this ceramic shop. And I said, yes. He said, I want to donate all the ceramics, all the paint, all the brushes to the church that you need. But I got one thing in mind. I want the ladies in the church to work together. My whole goal is to get people to work together together I think that's a pretty good vision don't you <laughs> so he did and the thing that was so vital to, at that time is the church was really hurting financially I mean I, I, I won't get into the details we were hurting financially and he said you you guys paint the ceramics you sell them and do it well part of that was during the Christmas season and one of the best salesmen we had, salespersons we had for the ceramics that the ladies were painting was Melody's mom, Louise House. Every time she'd come into church on Sunday, she'd have a list and say, I got this sold, this sold, this sold, this sold. How soon can you have them? And I'm going to tell you, people, I had people complain to me back then. We shouldn't have to sell things to make money for the church. Well, I agree. That's not the ideal. But it was those ceramics that got this church through the financial crisis we were in. Harry had a vision. And you know what? I believe it was God. Praise the Lord. And I thank God. What God did from an alcoholic sitting in his driveway, ready to end it all, to getting visions from God on how to get us through times that we were going through. Another story about Harry and Alice. Years later, Alice had a stroke. I mean, we have people that struggle like mad just to get two people to ready to get into the house of God on time. Harry would get up at 5 o'clock on Sunday mornings to clean Alice, to bathe her, to clean her, to get her ready to come to church. And they'd arrive here, and they were always early. Sacrifice. Sacrifice. But see, their story is part of the OBCC story. Another story I want to talk about is Jerry Boswell. You knew it was coming. <laughs> Jerry liked computers, and I worked on computers, and Jerry would call me and say, Mike, I don't know what I did to this thing. Can you come and fix it? So I'd walk across, and I mean, Marie, she, she heard one phrase all the time. Marie, give Mike some coffee. <laughs> she knew how I liked my coffee. But I would spend hours and hours and hours talking with Jerry about his computer and occasionally a little pitch about the Lord. I didn't bombard him with a Bible. I just wanted to become a friend to Jerry. And I was. He liked me, didn't he, Marie? And I liked him, too. And that went on for a lot of years. We'd talk in the yard, we'd talk over his computer desk, and we'd just spend a lot of time in fellowship. But one day, I was sitting in my office, which was the front room over in the parsonage at that time. and um, The Lord kind of spoke to my heart and said, look. And I looked, and Jerry was walking around the yard with his head kind of hanging low. And I just felt the Lord saying, go talk to Jerry. All right. Went out there and said, Jerry, what's going on? He said, well, been to the doctor, and the doctor says, I've got cancer, and I'm going to die. But I'm not ready to go. I said, Jerry, if that's your worry, we can get you ready. And I shared with him a lot of the verses about it, Romans 10, 9, and 10, and 3.23, and 6.23. And, and he said, well, I've, I've done a lot of that. And, well... And sometimes the Lord tells you to say something ornery. So I looked at Jerry and said, Jerry, either you're saved or the Bible is a lie. He got this look in his eyes and said, the Bible is not a lie. And I just grinned and said, I know it's not, Jerry. 
But then the Lord spoke to my heart. Because I said, uh, uh, Romans 3, uh, 10, 9, 9 and 10 says, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth. And the Lord kind of spoke to my heart that Jerry had never really confessed. He confessed the scripture, but he never confessed his salvation. I said, Jerry, I just want to hear you say, I'm saved. He looked at me and started. He said, I am saved. <laughs> and it just started sobbing. And there was never a question after that. But you see, the beautiful thing about Jerry's story is I got Marie's permission to start sharing that story. I wouldn't want to do it without the permission. There's times I've gone to pray for somebody in hospitals, not knowing the individual, not even knowing what to say. And when I was praying on the way there, it's just the Lord said, tell them Jerry's story. Well, then all of a sudden, it really became Jerry's story. And that's when I went back to Marie and said, Marie, can I tell Jerry's story? She said, you have permission to tell Jerry's story anytime you want to. So every funeral I've done since then, They've heard Jerry's story. Anytime I've sat down one-on-one -on -one with somebody, talked to them about salvation, I told them Jerry's story. Hallelujah. Jerry has won more people to Jesus than probably a lot of preachers of the gospel because he was just honest before God saying, I'm going to die and I'm not ready to go. But folks, that's what it's all about. Story number four, my pastor down in Florida. One time he was, when he was pastoring in southern Florida, he went to preach a revival in Tallahassee, Florida. Being a young man at the time, which we've all been there, he um, finished preaching the night service and thought, I'm just going to take off and drive home. Well, he preaches hard. If I, if I would preach as hard as he did, my eyes would be bulging out. I don't know how he can keep his eyes from going. <laughs> but he preaches hard and runs and does a little jig occasionally, and that's how he preaches. But rather than pay the money and get a room, after the evening service was over, he headed back to southern Florida, about a seven-hour drive. We're young. We can make it. But about two or three in the morning, there was a knock on his car window. <laughs> He was in the middle of nowhere. And if you know much about Florida, there's big cities, but there's a lot of middle of the nowhere. Bare and places. Well, this is he was in one of those places. And the highway patrol started pounding on his window. You okay? And he woke up. The car was still running. It was still in drive, but his foot was on the brake. He doesn't know anything else. <laughs> How he got to that place, why he pulled over, why his foot was on the brake, it was just two or three in the morning. They put him through all the tests to make sure he was sober. And he was. That's the ugly part, but the next day after he got home, he got a phone call from a little lady in his church. Pastor Joe, are you okay? Yeah, why? About two or three this morning, God woke me up and told me to start praying for you. Folks, there are stories like that all through the church world of people that God woke up in the middle of the night with somebody's name on their heart. And all he wants you to do is pray. I don't know how God can ever use somebody like me. Can you pray? Yeah. Well, God can use you. Pastor Joe is alive because some little lady woke up in the middle of the night and prayed for him. Folks, you can do that kind of stuff. And God still speaks to hearts like that. Another story. My story growing up on a three-quarter mile long gravel road. Dead end road. We played a lot of baseball. We rode a lot of bikes. We used to gravel road. You're in the middle of nowhere. But we had this one neighbor, this ornery woman. 
Anytime a bunch of the neighbor kids were there with her ball bats and gloves in her yard, she would say, do you know Jesus? <laughs> Are you saved? I, one time she confronted me and said, Are you, do you know Jesus? Are you saved? And I, I don't know. I go to church, but um, I don't like those altar calls. And she started preaching to me about altar calls. A nosy neighbor woman preaching to a neighbor kid 12, 13 years old about altar calls. Huh. Well, she aggravated me, but I never forgot those words. Many years later, as a 16-year-old teen, I went to a church youth camp because of the girl I liked. Sat through the service, then came that dreaded altar call. I fought it off. I didn't go forward. And I don't know who it was, but 15 or so minutes into everybody praying around the altar up in the front of the church, somebody walked back, got in my face and said, Mike, you know you really need to be up there. And I couldn't argue that. I, I went up. Three hours later, I got off the floor, saved and filled with the Holy Ghost. And the rest is history. Why? Because some neighbor woman preached to a neighbor kid about altar calls and about Jesus. Within three years, I was in Bible college. Three years later, I was a pastor at the age of 20, married to an 18-year-old pastor's wife. Side note, several years later, Sylvia Cobb passed. And her sons are all good friends. So Gary, he's a great Christian guy. Gary, his friend on Facebook, posted his mom had died, so I wrote him a letter about his mom and altar calls. Gary wrote me back and said, can we use it at mom's funeral? So Sylvia's testimony preaching to a neighbor kid and a neighbor kid ended up going into ministry and salvation and pastor for 50 years had its roots in his mother can God use somebody like me yes he can Acts chapter 12 I didn't give this to be up there but I just want to read the first five verses now about that time Herod the king stretched forth his hands to vex certain of the church. And he killed James, the brother of John, with a sword. And because he saw it please the Jews, he proceeded further to take Peter also. Those were, then were the days of the unleavened bread. And when he had apprehended him, he put him in prison and delivered him to the quaternions of soldiers to keep him intending after Easter to bring him forth to the people. Peter therefore was kept in prison. Verse 5, the second part. But prayer was made without ceasing of the church unto God for him. Prayer was made without ceasing unto God for Peter. And you all know the story. If you don't, long story short, angels got him out of prison. And he was headed to the group of the people that were praying. And when he got there, this is one name that you only see once in Scripture, I believe. And I remember it. I used to win a lot of Bible contests because I knew her name. But there was a girl that answered the door named Rhoda. Who is it? Simon Peter. She ran and started telling everybody else and left Peter standing at the door. But prayer was want to be made. Folks, if God's people could realize the need to pray. When Pastor Dave gets up here and says, we really need to be praying for so-and-so, you know what? You really need to be praying for so-and-so. Amen? I'll give you some more stories. I thought about when a I, I 
held her in my arms and dedicated her to the Lord, so I'm going to say it. I thought about this when this cute little girl in our church, Stacy Crow, started dating Brian Smith. Stacy didn't do what I've seen a lot of church youth do. She didn't say, well, I'm not going to take him to our church. We'll go to some other church. I mean, a lot of teens are afraid to take their date, potential mate, to their church because they speak in tongues there or because they cry there or they sing loud or they clap their hands. But Stacy didn't care. Stacy brought Brian to church. Stacy wasn't ashamed. And I am still proud to see the Smith family attending OBCC. I'm so proud of you, Stacy. I'm so proud of you, Brian. I love you too. I do, I do, I do. Thank you, Lord. I thought about Nick Myers in the preparation of this sermon. And how many times I would drive from Navarre over here, check the church out, and then go pull in Nick's driveway and see him sitting there. And we just talk and talk and talk. I didn't preach Jesus to you, did I? I didn't bombard you. I didn't take a 10-pound Schofield Bible and hit you over the head. We just sat there in Nick's driveway, Rusty number one, putting his head on my knee, me drinking a Coke or whatever he handed me. And we just talked. I asked a lot of questions about plumbing. I learned everything I know about plumbing in his driveway. <laughs> well, almost everything, but anyway. Why? Because we just talked and talked and talked and talked and talked. But one day, Nick uttered these words. What time are your services over there? And the rest is history. I can't tell you how proud this preacher is to look over there and see Nick Myers sitting here in a very real part of OBCC. Amen. I don't know how this church ever made it without him being part of it. But to be honest with you, Nick was part of it before he was ever part of it. Because every preacher was bold enough to say, Nick, <laughs> can you? And he did. He's always been a great neighbor. I thought of a guy that I met when I first started pastoring. His name was Richard Mogul. I worked with him in a foundry over in Tiffin, Ohio. And I never, I, I'm not the kind of guy that gets in your face and preaches Jesus. I will always tell you about Jesus, but I'm not going to bombard you with it. Well, Richard and his wife, Ginger, were expecting a baby. It was the middle of the winter. And one day, Richard came into work and said, Ginger had our baby, our little boy. A couple days later, Richard came in and said, our baby died. You're the only preacher I know will you do the funeral. Folks, if you don't establish relationships as a friend, and yeah, I did, it. I did that baby's funeral. It was 14 degrees below zero, and they had a gravesite service. And those were not fun, but it was worth the investment. Richard became a great friend ended up Richard and Ginger started coming to church and bringing their other two children and then they had a boy that was Scott's age and he ended up becoming a board member in my church why because we just sit and talk in a factory about grinding and about life and about whatever preparation of this sermon I thought about Bob Fain How many years did I go into Sears <laughs> talking to you about TVs and computers and appliances? And, and then one day Bob invited me over and I got to meet his beautiful little girl. That little Krista, I love that child. I just had Bob text me two more pictures this week. But one day, Sue's dad died. They were more familiar with this preacher than the preacher of the church they had attended before. Michael, you do. Sue's dad's funeral. And it's sure. The next Sunday, Bob and Sue started attending 
OBCC. Aren't you glad they did? I am so proud to look out and see Bob and Sue worshiping here. And so real. Even some of his Facebook posts, you know. In fact, he posted this morning, I want to start out the new year in right relationship with everybody. So feel free to apologize to me if you want to. <laughs> that sound like years ago there was a man that came here his dad had been a minister but there were issues and his name is Ron McGee and he played a bass guitar one day Ron McGee brought his friend Dave Decker and they'd visit occasionally but they weren't regular and they didn't join in for a long time but one day Dave Decker had a heart attack and had open heart surgery and I was called on to go to the hospital and I did. And that man has been a dear friend ever since then. Folks, I'm not telling you all those stories because of anything I do, but I'm telling you, you've got to establish relationships with people first because you care for them. you got to do it. you got to establish. People aren't going to trust you with their soul until they can trust you as a friend. And I'm telling you the truth. You can't go right out, find a sinner, and get him. Maybe it'll happen one in a big majority. But it's usually not going to happen that way. It's going to happen one-on-one -on -one because somebody invites you to church, somebody that they have invested their time into. And then they invite you, and you come. And when I look around this church, I see so many that that's the way it happened. God gave me a relationship with the individual first. First time I talked to Nick, he didn't say, Oh, yeah, I'm coming to church next Sunday. He didn't do that. Pastor Dave talked about the neighborhood. I thought, this is so crazy, but this is God. The day we installed the wheelchair lift, I, I, I don't know that I could say that God said, don't invite everybody. He didn't. But I just felt an impression not to make a big deal about installing the wheelchair lift. So I talked to two people. I talked to Lloyd and I talked to Nick said, we're going to install this. And, you know, too many hands. We just need to get this installed. So I asked Nick. He said yes. I asked Lloyd. Lloyd said yes. And we showed up on that Monday morning or whenever it was to install a wheelchair lift. We weren't at it 15 minutes, and Jerry Carpenter pulled his pickup truck into the parking lot and said, what's going on? We're putting in this wheelchair lift. Jerry put his truck in park. Walked around to the back of his truck, got his tool belt out, and said, what can I do? It wasn't too much later that Elias packs us. He was coming back from breakfast, and he pulled his truck into our church parking lot. What's going on? We're putting in a wheelchair lift. Parked his truck, got out, came over. What can I do? A few minutes later, somebody that's never been to our church for a service, been for a funeral, been in weddings, but Duffy down at the corner, Duffy was coming into... Well, he saw the commotion over at the church, so he walked across the properties and said, what's going on? And we told him, well, the sidewalk coming from there to the ramp is downhill this way, and it's downhill that way. So Duffy says, let's get it level. So we stuck wedges and prop whatever we needed to and got it fairly level so Duffy got down there with his tape measure and say okay front corner we need a spacer that thick back corner we need a spacer this thick this corner we need a spacer that thick he took all the measurements and said I'll be back and he went down to his house with his welder and with his saw and with his drills and cut us spacers for the, and welded them together so they had the exact thickness we needed for every corner of that wheelchair lift he brought back and said okay this is for that corner this is for this corner this neighbors and Duffy stayed around all day the rest of the day helping out with the wheelchair lift and across the street from Duffy another neighbor and when he got done working he came over and he started painting I think well, is that what it was he painting or do you remember Mark I don't know but Mark was here every and I never asked anybody but Lloyd and Nick Folks, establish relations. I can't tell you how vital it is to you get to get to know your neighbor. You ever want to touch their soul? 
you got to touch their heart first and be a friend. Amen. God can use anybody if you give yourself to him. Maybe I can't do what somebody else can do. I struggled in my early days of pastoring, and I even struggle still some now. Because when I started, I was young, and I thought, can God use somebody like me? Now I'm pushing 80, and I'm thinking, can God use somebody? <laughs> I don't know, but you know what, folks? I believe God can use anybody that says, use me. And make yourself, you know, we, we worry. I, 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 I'm not able to do this. I'm not able to do that. God never asks us to be able. He asks us to be available. And he'll make us able. He will use us if we do it. I mean, I, mean, I can't do what somebody else can do. But God never told me to do what somebody else can do. He only told me to do what he wants me to do. I mean, now we go to a church in Florida and I'm singing in the choir. I was told up here that I had just brought confusion when I sang, but now I'm singing in the choir. I thought of that old song, please let me sing in the choir, in the choir, please let me sing. That's never been my prayer, but they asked me and I thought, this is weird. The point of this sermon is the enemy has lured a lot of the church into a state of complacency. I can't. I don't know how. I'm too old. I'm too lame. I'm in a wheelchair. Oh, Debbie Adams. I'm in a wheelchair. I, 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 I can't do that. I don't know that much about the Bible. Well, so they don't do anything of eternal value. Make yourself available, whatever God would have you to do. Now, Pastor Dave asked me to speak. I said, yep. I wasn't going to argue. We did a series, and I'll finish with this, many years ago, a video series next door in the fellowship hall. And it was a video series, series called Strategic Intercession. And it was a good video series. I don't remember all of it, but I remember a lot of it. We've got to strategize, and we've got to go to the place. Sometimes you've got to march into the enemy's camp and take back what was stolen. Amen? But one phrase I remember from that strategic intercession video series. The speaker said he got a call from one of those big prophetic voices and said, I'm supposed to give you this word from the Lord. He said, okay, what's the word? God wants you to know you weren't his first choice. Isn't that a great word from the Lord? God wants you to know you weren't his first choice. Um, God wants you to know you weren't his second choice. But when you said yes, you became his first choice. Others waffled like it was too little. It was beneath them. Some of you old timers, old, old timers, older, older, older timers here at Richville, remember Bob Robbins? He was a piano player and he would write a song about it. He said, you throw out a subject and he he would write a song on the spot about that subject. Somebody said, mashed potatoes. He sat over here and wrote a song about mashed potatoes and the gospel. That, that part isn't important. But he said he was called on to speak at a church one time. And he said they had all of us ministers, and I'm the evangelist, I'm the speaker. I was sitting on the platform, and he said, I felt, I heard God say, I want you to stand up Turn around three times. I'm not going to do that. I might. <laughs> and in his head, he says, I'm not going to do it. And God said, I want you to stand up. 
turn around three times. No, that's beneath me. That's too stupid. And he fought it off one more time and stayed seated. And all of a sudden, he looked down and saw the pastor of that church down at the other end of the row stand up, turn around three times. <laughs> and when he did, it was some kind of a release that took place, and the power of God began to fall. It fell through the pastor. It fell through the congregation. Nothing spiritual about turning around in the circle three times, but there is something spiritual about obeying the voice of God. Whatever it is, however stupid it sounds. Folks, there are times it's awful stupid. We were at a, I went to a place in Crestline. We have to have an, used to have an open Bible church there. In the Crestline, one of the guys that went there was Gene Flinders. And I just stopped by to see Linda's cousin that was living by there. And they weren't there, but Gene Flinders was there. And Gene Flinders... I got a bunch of stories. Can I tell you one more too? Gene Flinders. I don't know why I'm supposed to do this, but he opened up his wallet. And God told him to give me all he had left. He had a fifty dollar bill. And he gave me a fifty dollar bill, but he didn't know. That was about all we had for groceries and, and bills and everything at that time, because we were hurting. I was pastoring here and that was those early days here. A long time ago, but God used that. There's another time we had a church in, in Ashland, Ohio. Pastor Bud had this fellow, Jones, out of southern Ohio come in for services. And it was Bud Rose was the pastor, and Bud says, Brother Jones asked if he could take up the offering today instead of me. And I said he could. Sometimes the evangelists have the anointing for a certain thing at a certain time. So he said, I, I have you, Brother Jones, come on up. Brother Jones got up to the pulpit and said, I really feel led to take up a love offering. Now, see, I've wrestled with going to that service that night because it's an hour drive and it was it would have got me back here around midnight and and how many know preachers have enough to do? You don't? They do. Because there's always somebody making a demand on your time. So I drove over to that service. I knew wishing I wouldn't have, because then they take up an offering, and I got to give in the offering too, and I didn't have a lot. But the pastor, or the evangelist, got up and said, we're going to take up a love offering. And I want it to be the best offering you've ever given. So I want you to get into that secret place in your wallet where you've got that $100 bill that you've been saving for a special need. Your wife doesn't even know about it. You've got it hidden away. But he said, I want you to give that today. I want you to get into the recesses of your purses and wallets. And I, I want you to. Now, the reason I'm doing this, the, past, the evangelist said, is because I don't want the money tonight. How many pastors do we have here today? And I raise my hand. I'm pastoring in Maslin, Ohio. Dwight Baldwin is pastoring in Akron, Ohio. And another pastor he said this love offering we're giving tonight is going to go towards our pastors I, I went over there wondering how I was going to afford gas and an offering to put in over there I came home with $300 cash in my pocket and so did Dwight Baldwin and so did another pastor because an evangelist felt led to take up an offering folks this is the kind of God we serve he does the craziest stuff. He's got his own story. But you know what? You do too. There are people in this church that probably have no idea how you got saved. I got a story. 
I turned on well, my, the one week when this whole thing started. My daughter says, well, just use their computer and get on and watch our church. They have live streaming. Well, Mike Caminetti was preaching that Sunday morning. And he said, I'm going to talk about my story. And I thought, come on, everybody's taken my sermon title. And I, and I had it a month ago. But one of the things Mike Caminetti said that morning was, you can debate your doctrine, but you can't debate your story. And I thought, wow. Nick could say, this preacher came over and he sat in my driveway drinking my Pepsi. Bob could say, well, this preacher came up and he always take my time talking about computers and TVs and took me away from other customers. He never did. But, but your story, folks, how, what it took for God to reach you and to reach others. I'm telling you, folks, what this church can do if everybody would just simply tell your story. Tell it to your next door neighbor. Tell it to your work partner. Tell it, tell it to the one you share this with or share that with. Tell your story. Amen. Father, in the name of Jesus, I just pray, God, for your people that we would be willing not to be necessarily great preachers, but simply to tell our story. Tell our story. And I believe, Lord, we can reach areas of Stark County that have never been reached because somebody here knows somebody over there that knows somebody over there that knows somebody over here and Lord the way the stories even now are intertwined because people have been faithful to telling their story help us not to be silent in Jesus name I didn't say amen yet because I got one other thing I want to do <clears throat> I want you all to stand some of you have already messed this up but but I want every one of you to go to somebody and tell them your story. That's our dismissal. I want everybody here to go to somebody and tell them, not a sermon, just tell them how you got saved because that's the bottom line. That's what it's all about. When you're done, then you can say amen. Go tell somebody your story. 